it Scott that needs to plan it? Yeah, you need Scott. Well, no one. We're live anytime. We're good. We're good. Yep. As long as you play. All right, can you hear me in the back? Good? All right. I have the absolute pleasure of introducing Dr. Sarah Bang from NSA. From NSA. NASA Marshall. <laughs> different acronym. Totally yeah. different. NASA Marshall. I was going to try to read the whole acronym, but you can see it there. Oh. <laughs> um, Sarah is joining us um, from NASA, where she's been a civil servant since 2020. Um, she originally went there to do her postdoc, um, but starting a little further back, in 2010, she got her undergrad from University of Chicago, which is a you know, big name in, in our history of the field. Um, and she'll share a little bit of a, a connection with Madison um, during her time there. Uh, then she went to work with Ed Zipser at University of Utah. She got her master's in 2013 and PhD in 2018, where I had the pleasure of meeting her um, to talk tropical convection. And now she's working on hail. And so we have the pleasure of hearing about her pathway and journey um, to using remote sensing to understand hail. Um, and a fun fact about Sarah is she was a competitive Irish dancer during her time in grad school, which shows how you can manage time quite well <laughs> to be able to do all that. All right, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, as and oh, let me turn myself on. Can you hear me now? How about, green, yes, green no? is good. Yep. Yeah, um, there we go. So, okay. Um, and so, uh, as Angela mentioned, I was an undergraduate student at the University of Chicago, which in the 50s and 60s was one of the most famous meteorology departments in the world. Carl Rossby was there, Ted Fujita was there. Uh, but then in the late 80s, they merged with the geology department to form a geophysical sciences department and went very much into theoretical um, sphere. So like fluid dynamics um, and like climate dynamics of other planets and things like that. And by the time I arrived, and I just wanted to look at thunderstorms um, and, and, and weather maps and things. I, I didn't look at a weather map once in college, not until graduate school. And so, while I was there, uh, before my senior year, uh, Professor Powell Wang came to Chicago to give a seminar talk. And he was talking about these cold cloud top signatures um, in very strong thunderstorms. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. And I actually reached out and asked if I could maybe learn this method, learn the model, uh, learn a little bit about this, and maybe study this for an undergraduate thesis. So the summer before my senior year, I drove up here from Chicago to uh, work with his group and learn his model. But uh, your department was having a barbecue, and you all welcomed me to the roof of this building. Um, I learned about Grant's band. Um, I attended one of uh, Professor Martin's map discussions, which still lives in infamy in my head. Um, but so, yes, I've actually <laughs> I have a wonderful connection with your department here. And so to be here um, as you know, speaking your colloquium is a tremendous honor. Um, but so, yeah, Angela already briefly touched on my history. I grew up in, you tell from my accent, I grew up in uh, Buffalo, New York, home of chicken wings and the <laughs> Buffalo Gnome. <no>. Um, <laughs> and suffered a very humiliating defeat yesterday in London. Um, from then, I went to uh, the University of Chicago, and then I headed off to the University of Utah to work with Ed Zipser. I applied uh, proposals to the NASA postdoctoral program, was selected, and headed off to Huntsville, Alabama to. Uh, go from lightning, you know, lightning to hail. I was working still in rhymed particles, but just basically multiply your updraft speed by three um, and look a lot higher in the cloud. <laughs> um, and then in 2020, I uh, flipped my badge to the civil servant side, as they say. So my specialties lie in the, in the severe end of the spectrum, namely lightning and hail, um, and then specifically detecting those phenomena from spaceborne platforms and using those detections to do all kinds of things like build climatology. Um, so hail, right? Anyone who's been through a hailstorm knows how uh, damaging and expensive <laughs> it can be, causing all kinds of threats to infrastructure, agriculture. Um, tens of billions of dollars around the, year, uh, the world each year are spent in insured losses. 70% um, of that number is attributed to hail. So 70% of the damage is due to severe weather around the world. That's not including floods or hurricanes, um, but that's attributable to hail. Um, anyone who works in uh, radar observations it has to deal with hail and multiple scattering and horrible attenuation and things like that. It causes all kinds of headaches. Um, we're talking about the very most upper end, upper 1 to 2 percent of all precipitating storms. So most precipitation retrieval algorithms have much 
bigger fish to fry. They're not going to gear their algorithms toward this really uppermost extreme. Um, it's very dangerous to measure in situ. Uh, we're going to talk about there was a series of field campaigns that they did in the 90s that are the only ones in existence in in-situ in hail because it's very dangerous to fly an aircraft through it. Um, so it causes all kinds of headaches. Um, and so that really motivates us to want to know where are the hailstorms around the world? How frequent are they? How severe are they? Um, obviously, you can, you can build this climatology using just surface reports, right? You go outside. If you are not all trained weather spotters, I encourage you all to take the training. Um, you call the weather service. You say, I'm at the corner of Orchard and Regent Street, and uh, you know, two inch hail just fell at 320. And then it goes into a network, and the people who develop algorithms are very grateful for your service. Um, in the United States, where we have what I have heard described as luxurious radar coverage, right? We have the next red right there. Hail shows up very plainly. In, in reflectivity data, you get these really crazy high 65 dZ reflectivities. If you ha are blessed with uh, dual polarization radar, it's going to show up in something like your um, ZDR. But, okay, if you want to know how hail is distributed around the world, okay? The spotter reports are not available all around the world. Um, there's not, it is not like a common reporting standard that every country adheres to. And even if there was, they don't have to share that data with us. Um, radar coverage is not available everywhere, right? In really remote, rugged, data sparse areas or over the ocean, where you can put a radar, okay? So the reason that we prefer satellite platforms is because that's a really globally consistent way to get a picture of what's going on. And you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, intergovernmental geopolitics. You don't have to worry about language barriers. Um, and then over the oceans, you can get this great coverage. So a lot of what I focus on is going to be these space-borne observations of severe weather for this reason. Um, so severe storms, they have some, they cause a bunch of headaches, but they do have very distinct fingerprints um, in the imagery that, that we like to use. So you're looking at, uh, this is MODIS, visible and infrared imagery. Invisible clouds, and the visible imagery, uh, tall clouds, they exhibit a lot of texture, this really kind of like cauliflowery, a very highly textured cloud, especially compared to something more uniform like an anvil, it's gonna show up. In infrared imagery, you get these very, very tall, very cold cloud tops. Um, this signature of the cold V and then this embedded warm spot is exactly what I was studying with Poway. Um, and then in the passive microwave, which is what I'm going to focus on today, you see these pockets of lower brightness temperatures. So I flipped the colors, the cool colors, the blues, that's high brightness temperature values. And then these pockets of um, warmer colors, that's actually we're getting lower brightness temperature, less radiation. And I'm going to dive into that. Um, because this department has such a long and storied um, backlog and uh, history of remote sensing, I thought I would dive a little bit into what actually goes into the wild west of making a severe weather <laughs> satellite algorithm. Um, and so if this is review for some of you from your remote sensing class, that's fine. Just we'll, pi we'll, we'll pick you up when we get there. So what is, what is the, what does the hailstorm look like? in passive microwave imagery, okay? This is, we're gonna use this case a lot. This is from uh, May 2012 in Oklahoma. If anyone was there, it caused like two, two and a half inch hailstorms that smashed people's windshields, all that. Uh, this is just, this is just a screen grab from the National Next Rad Radar, right? So you can see these really intense pockets of high reflectivity. Um, is it asking me if I'm working on it? Okay. <laughs> Somebody looks like, you're walking, are you exercising? Like, no. <laughs> okay, so uh, just about three minutes after this radar scan uh, was taken, the Trim Satellite Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission, it was a satellite in low Earth orbit between 36 degrees north and south, um, and we're looking at the Trim Microwave Imager imagery in 37 gigahertz, and we'll talk about why that frequency means something in a little bit. But corresponding to the intense pockets of high reflectivity, you see these pockets of very low brightness temperature. Okay, so passive microwave imagers have been in space since 1987. 
Um, and this signature of very low passive microwave brightness temperature associated with hail has been known for a very long time. And you can actually develop a relationship. So what you're looking here is this is your minimum brightness temperature for three different frequencies, 85, 37, and 19 from trim. And then present with hail probability of hail on the y-axis. So you can see this relationship between decreasing brightness temperature and increasing probability of hail, and the slope of that probability distribution will change with the frequency that you're looking at. Okay. So passive microwave. I always, when I talk about, when I talk at NASA, and there are a lot of like cosmologists in the room that look at the cosmic microwave background. They're used to being on the surface of the Earth and looking up for microwave. We're actually up in space and we're looking down for microwave. Okay. So just shift your perspective. Okay. An active sensor, like a weather radar, actually emits a pulse of radiation, and then you know if there's if there's particles with hydro meteors, then that is reflected back and is received. That's an active sensor, which, as a sidebar, uh, NASA has a fitness challenge every year with everyone in the agency, and our team name was the Active Remote Sensors. <laughs> I've never been prouder of anything in my life. <laughs> <laughs> After that, we were all passive remote sensors, and um, <laughs> what's happening is that at Earth's surface, um, microwave radiation is emitted by the surface, but also by liquid water, and it upwells from below. The sensor is up above in space, and is just receiving what comes at it from below. It's passive. It's not actively sending out radiation. Okay? So, in a clear atmosphere, because we're looking at like window channels, the atmosphere is transparent to these channels. It's not being um, attenuated by water vapor or anything like that. What is emitted from the surface, there's nothing in its way. The satellite will basically receive the amount that was emitted at the surface. Clear. Okay. However, if it's above a cloud, um, and in particular if there are ice particles in that cloud, they will scatter that radiation away. So that less is received above the cloud than was received in the clear air surrounding it. So what you'll see above a cloud with ice in it, in particular frequencies, you will see a brightness temperature depression, right? a lower brightness temperature where that upwelling radiation has been scattered away. And if there's a lot of ice in a very deep column, high concentration of a lot of these scatterers, your brightness temperature can be very significantly depressed relative to what's around, like hundreds of Kelvin. Okay, so the wavelength that you are choosing to look at, the frequency, right, because of that relationship, right, as frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. Very good. Right, so you want to make sure that you're looking at a frequency that's roughly in the wavelength regime of the particles that you want to look at. Okay, so a big part of when you're going, <laughs> when you're setting out to retrieve something, the frequency that you choose to look at is going to determine a lot of what you get out of it at the end. So a very common uh, frequency for precipitation microfrequency, 85 or 89 gigahertz. Right, this is in like three millimeter. Uh, wavelength, right? Getting at smaller drops and ice particles. Okay. As you go up in size, now the larger, the longer wavelengths are going to start responding to these larger particles, and even further, right? So, but if, if particles of this size to something like a short wavelength, the signature is going to be completely saturated and washed off. And so if I was looking at something like hail, I'm not going to look at a higher frequency because that signal will already be blown away by the smaller particles. Right? So I'm going to start looking in your 19 and 37 gigahertz range because their wavelengths are proportional to the size of particles that I'm going after. I don't care about cloud ice. Leave me alone. I want hail. <laughs> so for, you know, looking at two, this is that same storm we saw before. The color, the color bar has changed a little bit. I put them on the same color bar, except this is 85 gigahertz, and that's 37 gigahertz. This is the shorter wavelength, that's the longer wavelength. So you can see that there's a lot of scattering happening here, but then as I go to a longer wavelength, it's a little more immune to these smaller particles. So you can start to pick out 
more concentrated pockets of these larger particles that the signal's being kind of saturated in 85 megahertz. Okay, so choosing your frequency is gonna be a big deal. Another thing you need to think about is that water is a very strong polarizer. Not just a microwave radiation, but a lot of radiation. That's why fishermen like to wear polarized sunglasses. Right? Same reason. Um, and so compared to land, the water will have a lower fringe temperature. So here's Lake Michigan, lighten up like a Christmas tree when I only look at one polarization um, of the 37 gigahertz channel. Okay? There's a very simple mathematical transform polarization correction. It's really like, like just linear coefficients that you apply to the vertical and horizontal channels. But doing that will isolate the cloud signature and will not, will make sure that you're not saying that there's a hailstorm over Lake Michigan every single day. Well, I wish. No, I don't wish. Um, <laughs> um, but also, in terms of uh, you know, remote sensing, this, uh, the polarization difference is very useful for finding clouds over water. If you're trying to find like a depolarization signature, it's also great for finding inundated soil. You're saying, oh, the soil was dry and not today is completely inundated with water. There's going to be a polarization signature attached to that. So that's just like a cool aside. All right, another thing you have to think about is the footprint size of the instrument that you're dealing with and the frequency that you're dealing with. So this is trim, this is satellite we've been looking at before. As you go down in frequency, your footprint sizes get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. 19 gigahertz, which is one of the, the, the bread and butter of hail, <laughs> hail detection, in trim is 18 by 30 kilometers. So something like a 10 kilometer hail core is never going to fill the entire footprint but all you get is one brightness temperature. You don't get anything at an altitude, you don't get a map, right? You just, you get one value for this whole thing and it's taking into account this, but also all of this. So this is called non-uniform beam filling, right? Because this whole beam is not filled uniformly with what is scattering it inside. And so sometimes there's a trade-off between, okay, if I have a smaller but really intense scattering signature, versus a not as intense, but it's taking up more of the footprint, they might have the same brightness temperature, and you have no way of picking that out. And I would say, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to retrieve. Okay, so back to <laughs> back to our distribution, back to, okay, so you, you have all these things in mind, you're gonna be really careful about frequency selection and footprint size and non-uniform beam filling. You've done the polarization correction, right? So that's polarization corrected temperature. That's you're gonna be seeing that pretty much from now on. So you, you've done all that and you still, have, you still have this relationship with decreasing brightness temperature and probability of hail. Um, just as a heads up, the, the lower frequencies that get scattered, they get saturated, they can be scattered to really low temperatures by things that aren't hail. So in 85 gigahertz, with diamonds here, your, your predictive capability kind of tops out at 60%. It's not gonna be the most useful for hail. Um, so commonly in the literature, you'll see a lot of uh, like threshold. You say, okay, you know, I have I have a job to do. I need to make a living and to move on with my life. I'm just going to say, if the 37 gigahertz temperature is below 220 Kelvin, we're going to call that hail. Right? Um, you can also do kind of like a like a lookup table and you know make these kinds of spectral bins of probability for a given range of brightness temperature. You can do that too. Um, what Dan Cecil and I at NASA Marshall did was just take it one step further to actually fit a curve to that probability line and then you know, parameterize it with an equation. So I was talking about like logistic regression and actually as like machine learning, but I actually like regressed the logistic curve, so I think I was the machine that was doing the learning <laughs> in this case. Um, Postdocs, man, it's a trip. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so the algorithm that I'm going to talk about today is the Bang and Cecil algorithm, um, and it incorporates 19 and 37 gigahertz um, in, in various combinations, but you basically have a map of probability for given bins of brightness temperature. And as you go down, in, I guess as you go you know, towards the reds, that's in these combinations of brightness temperatures that lead to increased probability of hail. All right, another thing you have to think about, oh, go ahead. Um, you have normalized uh, tropopause size. Is that WMO tropopause or something like that? It's, it's the cold point tropopause, and oh. it's like you are a plant in the audience. Oh. <laughs> 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 that wasn't planned. Okay, so remember that you're dealing, right, the, the, the depth of the column, the concentration of the scatterers that you have determines the brightness temperature that you have. 
right? So what is the what is the tropopause I do with latitude? Lower, lower, lower. So even if you know, so you have a cloud at mid-latitude, it could be over here in the tropopause. It's real strong guy. Even if you have one of the tropics that doesn't even, it doesn't even necessarily have to overshoot the tropopause, but it just has so much more real estate to deal with here that you can have a deeper layer of scatterers for something that's no less or no more intense than in the mid-latitude. But just because of the amount, the, the depth of the scatterers you can have is going to affect your brightness temperature. So that's another thing you have to take into account. And so one thing that we did is we, we calculated cold point tropopause from reanalysis data to, and we normalized our depression by that height, just so that you're, you're basically saying, you know, if it's a really deep layer, that that signature of a deeper tropopause at lower latitudes is dampened a little bit. Okay, so that's that's why that's that's the denominator that you're seeing in the 37 degrees temperature. Okay, so now you've done all this work, you've caught you've caught your T's, you've dotted your I's, you've been really careful about everything. So now, finally, you have this map of probability for brightness temperature. This means that for any storm observed by the satellite, for any given set of brightness temperatures, right, so the storm here, storm here, storm here, storm here, you can now assign a probability from zero to 100% of hail. Okay, so the big strong guy, 81%. Probably, probably had hail in it, it definitely did. Um, but then, you know, weaker storms, they're not, good, they're not scattering a lot of brightness temperature. They don't have, of course, finally very high probability of hail. So then, once you take into account the orbit of the satellite and you tally up all of the hailstorms, you can finally build your climatology of hail and see throughout the lifetime and domain of the satellite where are the hailstorms happening around the world. Okay? So, hot spot is central United States. We all know about that one. Hot spot in Argentina. Professor Rao knows a lot about that one. Okay. There are actually people that have died in the Bangladesh Meghalaya area from hail injuries. Um, a huge new uh, sector in insurance is South Africa in hail. Right? So all you know, you publish this map, everyone's very excited. So now, I mentioned that passive microwave satellites have been in orbit since 1987, and uh, there are four recent satellites that have the same frequencies that I use, um, and they are in similar orbits and similar foot, similar footprint sizes. So as you've been looking at TRIM, there's also the Global Precipitation Measurement Satellite. And then these two, um, AMSER E and AMSER 2, they are, were and are onboard satellites in sun synchronous orbit. So you could maybe, since if you have you know, satellites with similar frequencies, could you apply these hail probabilities to other satellites and make a longer or more robust climatology? Well, then there's yet another caveat you have to think about. Okay, these instruments, they may have similar frequencies. They're going to have completely different footprint sizes. These are the same frequencies for trim and GPM. Look at the difference in their footprint size. Now, if you remember back to that 10 kilometer hail core that we had, Right? A, a hail core this size takes up, I don't know, maybe 15%, 10%, no, 15% of this, of the trim footprint. But compared to a much smaller GPM footprint, it's going to fill a much larger portion of it. So for the same exact storm, this will yield a lower brightness temperature, right? Because more of its footprint is being taken up by that big, cold, scattery palooza. So TRIM and GPM actually overlapped for a few months in 2014. This is the same storm in central Louisiana, same exact color scale, same exact frequency. They are about eight minutes apart. Look at the difference between that, that storm's minimum brightness temperature and that one. It's the same storm, eight minutes apart. The so GPM, which has a much smaller footprint, same storm, much, much lower brightness temperature. So you, can't, you cannot apply an algorithm trained on trim to GPM just straight like that because it's, gonna, it's going to make artificially high probabilities for the exact same storm. Um, okay, another thing you have to think about 
especially when you go, if you're going to go beyond the tropics, trim went to 35 degrees, you're going to go beyond the tropics, now you've got snow cover, sea ice cover. That is really cold ice. And it will tell the passive microwave, that's really cold ice there. It'll say, whoa, there's a catastrophic hailstorm over Siberia every single day. <laughs> like, okay, man, they got a lot of hail in the Himalayas. I don't know about you guys. Um, so, something that comes up when you're going to start looking at higher latitudes, how do you how do you account for that? How do you remove that signature? If you're not going to use a radar, if you're not going to use some kind of temperature profile, how can you tell the difference between a big strong hailstorm and snow on the ground, sea ice? We actually found by leveraging uh, lower and higher frequencies against each other, we found a variable that has a very sharp divide in uh, what has you know, precipitation according to a radar and what does not. So we applied this filter to say, okay, anything that fails this filter is probably not a hailstorm, it's probably a snowstorm on the ground. Okay. When you're dealing with different footprint sizes, you also have to adjust the distribution of brightness temperatures to account for that, that problem of locating. So once you do all that, then you can apply your climatology to a different sensor. So this is what the same climatology, same methodology, all of the adjustments have been made. This is what it looks like in the GPM domain, which now goes to much, much higher latitudes. And when you have satellites in similar kinds of orbits, like inclined orbits, like trimming GPM, with careful normalization, of course, you can combine them to make a climatology that goes from 20, 1997 through now. Okay, so you go through all this work, you double check everything, you adjust the footprint, you adjust for the orbit, you adjust the normalization and the frequency difference and all this and you publish this climatology and everyone accepts it as the truth and you win a Nobel Prize and it gets published in Nature. <laughs> no, as soon as you publish this, then the questions come in, right? Then you have someone who's from this area, they're from near Lake Maracaibo and they say, it really doesn't hail that much where I'm from. <laughs> you have someone from like Sub-Saharan Africa that's like, uh, yeah, we get thunderstorms all the time, but we've never seen a hailstorm. And certainly nothing on par with the central United States. Right, so then all of these questions. So I had colleagues in Switzerland that said, hail's here all the time. Where's our hail on your map? <laughs> okay, so now, so once you publish this, now you start to say, okay, well, I'm not going to march into the Congo and tell them I know more about their hail than they do. <laughs> right, I believe them. I believe them when they say, I think your algorithm has a bias. There must be some some process that you're not resolving here that the microwave is missing. Okay, how do we how do we test that? How do we <laughs> how do we go after that? Um, on board both the trim and GPM satellites, they had active sensors. They had and have um, a precipitation radar, which actually that's what sends out sends out a pulse of radiation. But that can actually tell you what's going on at different altitudes and not just one singular brightness temperature. Right. So when we looked, we looked at you know, land and tropical land and subtropical land and ocean and all this, and we really didn't see big differences in the profiles. The radars were saying, you know, at minus minus 20, you're still getting what, more than 45 dBz at minus 20. Okay. When we look across the globe, if we had a systematic bias with latitude, you would see a blue band and a red band. We don't see that. So the satellite, the algorithm is doing its job. It's finding hail. It's finding hail aloft in the cloud. There is a yeah. question online. Okay. Dan Weimann asks, could you hone the footprint using the higher frequency bands to identify areas that would clearly not have hail, like filtering out storm-free areas? Possibly. Uh, I think one of the I think one of the more prominent questions is. It's finding strong storms, but not necessarily hail storms. So the smaller frequencies may still be, they would still respond to a thunderstorm or something like growl bowl that would cause like electrification. Um, but I have been wanting to talk to some, if anyone knows about like deconvolution of overlapping footprints, I have questions. Okay, um, but thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so one of the things we're thinking about is, uh, is there a disconnect? The sat is the satellite seeing hail aloft? But we don't know anything about what happens to the hailstorm once it leaves the cloud. Right? Especially in the tropics, 
if it's falling into a very warm and very humid environment, that could very easily melt a hailstone, especially if it's small, small surface area, right? We don't have any information about that. There is a disconnect in our understanding because the satellite's doing its job. It's finding hail aloft in the cloud. But can, is there something we can learn about what happens to the hailstone as it falls towards the ground? I also haven't been timing myself. Am I doing okay? I'm doing okay. Um, so, <laughs> I was joking that every time I get one of these phone calls that says, it's actually more like an email, who calls anybody these days? Um, you know, what's going on? Like, why do you have so much hail in the tropics? Why do you, you know, that's just a new question. A new question leads to a new project, a new avenue of work. So, hit me with your phone calls. I'm ready. Um, so one project that spun out of this is actually looking at, looking at the properties of the hailstone, looking at their size distribution. Can we simulate their melting in a whole plethora of environments so that we know that given this satellite signature, if we melt it, if it's falling into a certain environment, what would you hypothetically expect at the ground? What's possible? Um, and we're trying to do that from as many perspectives as we can. So one of the first ones is, I mentioned that there was a series of field campaigns in the 90s using the armored T-28 aircraft, where they took observations using all kinds of particle probes of hail in situ above the freezing level. Now this is, it's so dangerous. <laughs> These are the only observations of hail above the freezing level in situ in existence. And for a very long time, several of the probes, their data were unusable. But there's a very clever scientist at NCAR named Eric Vansmer, who has a fabulous new reprocessing tool, who was able to, for the first time, render usable these data in hail to actually get at the particle size distributions sampled in situ by this aircraft. Once you have that, you can start making relationships with radar reflectivity, terminal velocity, the kinetic energy of these particles as they fall. That's going to be very important for how fast they melt. Right? If it's falling, if it's really big, and it's falling really fast, it's not going to melt very much. If it's a little bit smaller, and it's falling a little bit more slowly, and the atmosphere has more time to work on it, now we're talking about something different. So then, um, I have uh, some very fabulous co-eyes at AER in Nebraska who are actually simulating, simulating that melting process. So they are looking, they are slightly modifying the atmospheric profile, making it a little bit warmer, making it a little bit more humid. You know, and for all these different combinations of environments, you know, is the hailstone uh, sucked back up into the updraft? Does it melt completely? What size has it shrunk? Has it melted, but it still reached the ground as a solid piece of ice? Right, so if we're given PSD, if we're given environment, what kind of melting can we expect at the bottom? Another thing that we're building, we call them multi-platform precipitation features. Anyone who has ever worked with NSIPS or Chantel Liu's data knows about the precipitation feature database. Okay, what it does, basically, so this is what a GMI microwave swath looks like of a storm. Okay? The algorithm goes in and applies a boundary around it and says, okay, this is a storm and we're gonna save all the characteristics within it. So here's the boundary. And here's now the 37 gigahertz from this temperature within that boundary. And so you can learn some characteristics of that storm. Um, because there are so, you know, I want to be, uh, a lot of students, there's a lot of opportunity for these data. Very similar data, kind of in this vein of thought from the presentation we did they are down, like downloadable right now from the PPS server, so if this interests you, it's available in public, you can go right now. Okay, so what we're doing is going one step further. The NASA GPM program has something called the Validation Network, where they have actually gone in and found every instance when the DPR radar coming down from space intersects with a NEXRAD sweep from the ground, and they have saved them all. So. You can see it was originally for the purpose of like validating precipitation algorithms using ground radar, but they still have it. We can use it for all kinds of things. So, not only are there, you know, you have this ground radar matches, there are several radars in the United States that are close enough to enable dual Doppler analysis. What is it, what, it, what does dual Doppler analysis allow you to look at that you couldn't look at before? Fall velocity. Fall velocity, 3D winds, updrafts. Downdrafts, okay? So we have gone in and found all of the matches from GPM in the validation network only in radars that have 
the half of the dual doppler, half your 3D winds. And we have assembled what we call multi-platform precipitation features because we've got multiple platforms. Okay. And it goes in and it, it assigns these feature boundaries. We save all of the characteristics within. Anyone who's a real DPR nerd, this is Chandra's flag hail product. We don't have to talk about that right now. Um, but so yeah, what this what this enables is now you can look at all of the radar variables, lithicity, vertical velocity, that beautiful updraft. And if the radars are dual polarized, you can use you can find the hydrometer identification for this group and tie them all together. So one concern that we have is that, you know, is it hail or is it ground fault, right? Both of those things can lower your brightness temperature. And how, did the, how does the spatial distribution of those things affect the temperature that you get in the end? And that brings us back to our old friend, non-uniform beam filling. Okay, so, we talked before that passive microwave imagers, especially the ones that we use, especially in the frequencies that we use, they have very large footprints, okay? Um, do I have it on here? Yeah, so this is, this is a very useful tool to have, like fill in the pixelated maps. So you can see where the pockets of low brightness temperature are. Okay. This is actually what the size of the footprint is. Relative to the size, basically the size of the storm. Okay. So one project that we have also taken on, you know, in trying to answer some of these questions is is there a way that we can add information to this passive microwave, right? Um, and there is. On the Aqua satellite, they had on board a passive microwave radiometer, my bread's butter, but they also had MODIS, which is an infrared and visible um, instrument. Now, MODIS, these are, look at this beautiful, beautiful cloud texture, has fabulous resolution. But it can only see it at the top. It can only tell you what's going on at the top, how tall it is, how cold it is, how extensive is the anvil, but it can't actually tell you what microphysics are going on in the depths of the updraft. Passive microwave has horrible spatial resolution, but it's responding to the cloud microphysics and the ice particle microphysics deep within the cloud. So one project that we're working on now is can we Using these two instruments that were on board Aqua together, can we use one strength to fill in the weaknesses of the other? Can we map out, you know, the, the, the distribution of the overshooting top pixels relative to something like the microwave footprint and use that to inform each different product? Okay. We've gone in and we have identified several cells in the United States just to start, and we're trying to look at combining something like an infrared product, infrared tropopause difference, for different bins of, say, past microwave brightness temperature. And you can see here, as we go from blue to red to black to green, blue to red to black to green, you start to see that these characteristics, they share a trend. You can look at them in two dimensions, looking at something like mesh, which is a radar product, you don't have to go into that now, but you'll see a shift in 2D space for these different kinds of parameters. Can we pair them together to extract more information? Um, okay, so that's that is that's where we're going with all these questions and how do we, you know, how do we <laughs> respond to those phone calls and the questions when they come? Because clearly there's some things, some things missing, some processes that are not being resolved in our current climatology. So ah, I once heard uh, uh, someone from the Department of Defense <laughs> say that they call NASA the hippies because it's like free data, public access, <laughs> right? Except it's true, <laughs> okay? Especially when dealing with something like super high impact, right, that is gonna influence your homes and your crops and your economies, right? This, you know, this should be and is accessible to everyone. So I just wanted to point out, especially because there's so many students here, if you're looking for a research project, uh, the climatologies that I presented, they are available from the NASA DAC, the NASA GHRC uh, data center. There's a really nice tool that our colleagues at NASA Langley have put together, an ArcGIS, 
where you can overlay all different kinds of uh, hail and lightning climatologies on maps and zoom in and look at the distribution and things like that. Uh, the multi-platform features that I talked about, those are very recently available, not the hail ones. These, there's ones that are matched with lightning, but we're working on it. Um, and then a lot of the retrievals and validation that I mentioned, they're all open access um, in journals. So not only are we hippies, uh, we're also marketers. But I also did want to point out that, that NASA has a whole series of internships, pathways, internships, that kind of thing. And if there are any undergrads in the room, there's something called the DEVELOP program, which is like a, like a summer research program and you're paired with like a NASA group and you do like a really in-depth research project in our science. Um, and then I was a part of the NASA postdoctoral program um, and those are ongoing all the time. And there are you know proposal calls that you can apply to. So ponder that. Um, and so as I take your questions, I'm going to leave up this really nice four panel of a storm that hit pretty close to home, it looks like, for you guys. This is the, the 2020 derecho, the famous one. Uh, my colleagues at Marshall and at Langley and several colleagues from the U.S. Weather Service and state climatologists um, put out a paper in BAMS. It too is open access, but we were looking at this storm from every kind of platform we knew how. If a satellite got a picture of this storm, we looked at it. Um, and so just for some really nice comparison, this is what the storm looked like in the infrared, in an extra radar, passive microwave, the best, clearly, and then to a really unfortunate bridge silo that um, got crushed. So with that, I will take your questions. Thank you so much. Um, could you go into a little bit more detail about how you uh, calculate the tropopause height for your climatologies? Mm -hmm. um, I think the map that I had is from ERA data. Gosh, we really we did a lot together. <laughs> like this map? Yeah. So it, uh, I used reanalysis data and then calculated a cold point tropopause based on where the where the slope of the temperature profile changes um, at a certain rate to um, just to get a to get a height. You can use we used a cold point tropopause height from and it's now Maritou reanalysis, but the distribution like how you know the tropopause change height change with latitude will be exhibited in. Hmm. And is that like do you have like a seasonal uh, cycle in that? Do you have a seasonal cycle in the trouble was high change? I didn't look at that. Okay. I just calculated it just so that I could get a normalized depression. Um, did I actually look at the seasonality of what the trouble was height is doing? No, okay. I didn't. I'm sure there is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but then, I, I didn't plot it, no. And then the, the second question I had is whether or not there's um, anomalies in the trouble pause height associated with deep convection where you would like almost always see a change in the height associated with the convection so that like compared to climatology it's always higher or lower and that that might like induce some bias in the air. I don't, it's entirely possible. Okay. Um, I would say especially working with something like reanalysis data and would bet detail like that would be washed out. Um, especially in the time, you know, it's what, every six hours or something like that. I don't, and I don't know honestly how long such an effect would last. I don't know if it would rebound at a certain rate. Um, but that's certainly a fascinating question. Thanks. Um, given that your hail model is probabilistic, how do you how do you determine hail presence if it's you no know, if you're getting a percentage probability? So how do, how do I actually get a map with counts in it? Yeah, well, how, is what how you're how asking about. That? So we actually we tally up all of the like the whole spectral probability we cut it off below 20 percent otherwise your thousands of storms in the ITCC that would have like a four percent probability of hail would just dominate the spectrum so we cut it off at 20 percent 20 percent above we add up that spectral probability and then we also add up um, the number of samples in each box we normalize for area and you know overpasses per day to get at a number, but this this number per year actually comes from a sum of the spectral probabilities. So, if, in an example, if a if a box had for the same amount of samples, 
five 20% storms and one 100% storm, it would look the same color on my map. Yeah? Um, do you have an explanation of the under predictivity of the result for Switzerland? For Switzerland? Yeah. Switzerland? I, I don't. Um, one, so the, the one bias, <laughs> one of many, that we're finding is that it has, it very preferentially uh, finds larger, more mature kind of MCS-like storms. Um, we think it's missing smaller, younger convection. Um, and I'm wondering, in a mountainous region, if you you know you would not be able to have that big structure if it would be much more, much smaller and isolated systems that pop up. But yeah, my Swiss colleagues are like, oh, we get ill all the time. So that's I think one thing. One if you look if you look too closely at Argentina, which I told told you not to do. <laughs> The hail maximum, Angela, is actually like over here, not over here. It's too far northeast. Um, and so the paper was just submitted where we looked at that and we're finding, it's, it's finding strong storms, but it's preferring bigger ones. And it's probably missing smaller, younger ones. Um, so I'm wondering if that might also be happening. I don't know what Swiss thunderstorms are like. We'll write a proposal. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just kind of wondering about diurnal impacts. Mm -hmm. of, I, I'm not too familiar with how Trent's orbit was, but over time, does that just get washed out and what your brightness temperatures look like? Yeah. So Trim and GPM are both in inclined orbits, and so they they don't have a preferential time of day, as opposed to something like a, syn a sun synchronous orbit. Um, but the inclined orbit, yeah, it kind of samples agnostically with time through the day. And so that any kind of diurnal cycle is not just, it's not washed out, but it's not it's not preferentially observing in a certain time of day. Um, and so we actually, for that reason, we use trim and GPM to look at the diurnal cycle because it's not going to be hindered by that. And um, it is not the same thunderstorms. We are finding so like here in the United States, when do we when are big thunderstorms more common? What time of day? Two to four p.m. something like that. Two to four in the afternoon, yeah. right? Afternoon. I was in Alabama, early evening, early evening yeah. time, right? Um, the peak that we're finding in South America is at like one in the morning. You get these crazy nocturnal storms um, as well. So it's a great question. Other student questions? We'll open up to your question. No. I have one, um, well, actually one and, a, well, two. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry. So just looking at this map um, and thinking about uh, what you were talking about, uh, issues with your retrieval, mm -hmm. is it possible that the issue is emissivity from the trim satellite, actually in the actual retrieval? Because the areas, especially over Africa mm -hmm. and Argentina that you're pointing out might present issues with emissivities and how do you treat emissivities and retrievals over land, which is an issue that will influence the microwave retrieval. So even if those really long wavelengths, you think? Maybe. Okay. It's, I mean, the, the reason why I'm suspicious is because of the African, specifically around that region where you have most of those um, detections. Mm -hmm. That m m seems like it's a potential area for issues with emissivity. I mean, I would believe it. I don't think, I think we have largely ignored that. So, we should talk to each other. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that could be a proposal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds callous, but I'm just like, yeah, bring your problems to me. I'm just, that's a new project. We'll write it up. Let's go. Just call, just call me all day. And the other question that I have, I think in one of your climatology um, plots, you're using 37 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. But in others, you're using 19, and I know you mentioned before that 19 might be a preferable channel to so, use for retrievals. Why do you alter from 37 to 19? It's actually, we use both. 
So the, the actual algorithm that we're using is employing, it's a combination of the minimum 19 concurrence for the feature, and then this normalized depression. So it's actually the feature maximum minus the feature minimum divided by the trouble pause height. So that actually, so the, the, the greater the depression, especially with trouble pause height, the higher the probability of fail. The lower the 19 gigahertz probability, the higher the probability. The lower the 19 gigahertz brightness temperature, the higher probability. That's why this, so this map of probability is what the actual retrieval is using. It's using both frequencies to try it. Because the 19 is, it's, if you're scattering at 19, it's a true, it's a true hail scattering signature. It's not sea ice or something. That has a very high correlation with likelihood of hail. Um, 37 gigahertz as well, it's a shorter wavelength. It, 37 gigahertz will respond to ground flow very effectively, so we didn't we didn't want to base the retrieval just solely on one or the other. So we created a, a function that is of both. Um, Ian and John. Um, so the well, the Nextrad network is pretty great. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of times where dual Doppler is correct typically viable. Have you considered looking at proposing a build campaign or looking at an older build campaign, possibly like the con, where there's a lot of gap filling radars in the field? So one so the the coincidence requirement that you say where we have to have a hailstorm over dual Doppler low is exacerbated by the fact that it also has to have a GPM overpass. So that's three things. And so for the entire GPM lifetime since 2014, Hailstorm, Dual Doppler, GPM overpass, all at the same time, there's 76. <laughs> 76. Now, we have also opened it up to all of the radars in the VN, and then we get several thousand instances where we can, and we can do statistics like that, but in terms of like actually getting the 3D winds and doing statistics on that, you're, the problem that you mentioned is, is, is a problem. Our sample size is going to be so reduced because getting that amount of coincidence is so restrictive. It's like looking for like three perfect, three perfect needles in a haystack, and the needles are moving, and the haystack is moving, and your magnifying glass only comes over once a day. It's like that. Um, so proposing a field campaign, I mean, I would do a field campaign any day of the week. Um, I love that, but no, there's no there's no field campaign for that in the works at present. Huh? Oh, okay, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Call me. Okay, sorry, John. <laughs> Does uh, GPM measure anything poleward of 35 degrees? Yes, GPM goes up to 69. Okay, so is there a warm season climatology that you're thinking about looking at? Because oh, you can warm get season climatology? Yeah, you know, of hail over Canada, over over Europe, over the North Atlantic. Yeah, we're looking at the whole oh, season. There we go. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Okay. Yeah. So this is trim and GPM combined, which means that from 30 in the 35s, it goes all the way back to 1997, mm -hmm. and then pull word of that, it's just GPM. But yes, you can start to you can start to see a little bit of hail up into Canada. Um, and, and I guess my follow up is, what about using these data sets to interrogate episodic events? Where you get a, you know a massive flux of high theta air in the in the summertime, yeah, and it gets up to 70 degrees or something, and whether or not those events have their own climatology. So you stratify all your data to times when theta e at 700 millibars above 330 exceeds, yeah. gets northward of 50 degrees, and I then would you say look just at those days. You make a map, and we'll compare my map against your map. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you're on. Yeah. Do I have a deal? <laughs> yep, you're on. Yeah. yeah, so uh, one thing I didn't show, and I wish I had, um, colleagues of mine at, uh, at Marshall, they are working with SAR, and they have actually figured out that crops that are laying down look different, they are brighter in SAR than crops that are standing up. So they have actually figured out a way to very accurately map crop damage due to a storm, no, due to anything, really. And so actually the, 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 the Iowa derecho paper that I mentioned, it goes into that, where they were actually mapping, because the crops were near maturity, it was late August, they were near maturity, but if you're, if you're using something like NDVI, which is a vegetation index, that's based on how green something is. But right after the storm, the corn's still green. 
And that, if you wait a couple weeks, it'll die and turn brown, and then it will show up. But you want to know right away. So they figured out using SAR that they could map using, so one, I'm, I've been comparing my hail maps to their damage maps um, and seeing, like, are we seeing similar hot spots um, or are, are uh, who's missing something? Doesn't but work with wheat, though. They or did doesn't. corn and soybeans, so which was predominantly what was happening in Iowa. Okay. I don't know about wheat. I don't know what the reflectivity of flat wheat is. Yeah, that'd be interesting. <laughs> I see the flames right there. That would be More uh, questions? Sorry. <laughs> I have so many proposals to write with all of you. This is going to be a busy year. We'll do Yeah. I have one quick question. I'm curious about because this method predominantly depends on what's happening on the cloud top and how it is detected in the clouds. Do you have like, Does it usually even precipitate every time the hail detection detects hail? Not even just rain or snow, but does it even like rain down every time it's being detected or does it not? I think the point at which you're making hail, it's going to fall. I mean, smaller hail can be sucked up back into the updraft and infected along somewhere. Um, but I think particles that large will event, unless, you know, once they leave an updraft and they're not being suspended anymore, they don't, they can't stay there for very long. I keep paying attention to that secondary roll side out of South Africa it seems to be like the only major one that's like over the ocean. Yeah. Is that one real? Is it, is it like yes. legit? Yes, it is. If you look at other climatologies, they show uh, they show this offshore. Um, it may be washed out a little bit by the projection, but you we do also see it offshore of South America as well. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. This this prominent this is real. Um, there's also in Australia too. Australia, yeah. Yeah. Is there a little one? I'm, I'm like going blind up here. Yeah, I think no. it's just the way it is projected. Yeah. Yeah. TV screen has a better. Yeah, the TV screen is better. The TV screen is better. The bigger one. That's still like one of the biggest ones. Yeah. Is it because of the Agulas current? What's going on there? That's like. Likes. I don't know. I mean, so the the ones offshore of Argentina, we know that they have these giant MCSs that will propagate mm -hmm. offshore. Um, that would be my guess for what's going on there too, but I don't know anything about the sea currents. I'll, I'll say that it also shows up in the lightning. Shows up in lightning as well. Yeah. yeah the, what is the fascinating? Comparing this to a lightning climatology, which lightning was my first love. Um, where they agree, where they are similar, where you're seeing hot spots in the same place, and where they are not. Now there are some places where I'm also showing a hail hotspot that I don't believe. For example, Lake Maracaibo. This is like one of the most lightning active places in the world. Uh, not famous for hail, and certainly not like top of the scale, on par with you know Oklahoma hail. <laughs> not so much. Um, so one thing is, is the algorithm getting tricked? by large, deep columns of gravel that will scatter your brightness temperature very effectively. And they don't even have to be that large. They just have to be a very high concentration. And that will scatter your brightness temperature through the floor. But it's not hail. So you know, can we, can we get very clever about the you know, selecting environments or about playing frequencies off each other to try and isolate a signature of hail? As much as we love gravel, that's not what we're looking at here. So one more question. So maybe I just need to go read your paper. <laughs> or don't, that's fine. Have you, have you split it up? So you said this is just a summation of probabilities. Have you split it up so that, like, I, I'm wondering if some regions have lots of low probability events mm -hmm. and not very many high probability events, which on this, you, you said. You say it sums it up. the same on this. And so yeah. like, if you split it up, like, are there regions that have lots and lots of low probability events with no high probability yeah. events versus other regions that have a distribution that would look more like you expect, because like I would expect the central U.S. where we know there's hail and where a lot of your validation stuff has occurred. Yeah. Like I expect that you have a normal, like a, a pretty good distribution of those probabilities. But then in other regions, maybe if it's due to a bias, you could tell just from the fact that the probabilities aren't distributed so, correctly. So there's two papers that I mentioned. The side one is where we created the we created the algorithm and then made our first climatology. The second is where we actually went in with the radars to try and test the microwave retrieval against the active sensor. 
Um, and we did break those down into like just looking at storms with plus or minus 20 percent, plus or minus 50 percent, and then, you know looking at the spectrum, looking at the windows, trying to see like are we seeing systematic biases in certain places versus others relative to the radar. Which again, it's also a remote sensing product. Um, and one of, one of the biggest problems or questions that we ask ourselves is what are we going to call the truth? Do we call, is the only thing that's truth, a farmer in Iowa saw a hailstorm, called it in the SPC, is that the truth? Is mesh the truth? I wouldn't call mesh the truth. Um, is, a, is a radar product the truth? What is, there's a Bible, what is truth, right? Um, what are you going to call true? Uh, it's a big question that we ask ourselves regularly because not, not all the same ground truth is the same everywhere. <laughs> and then you have to ask yourself, so we trained our retrieval in the United States using SPC reports. Is a retrieval trained in the United States applicable everywhere else? Like I, I said that the United States, you know, our hail diurnal cycle, thunderstorm diurnal cycle is totally different than Argentina. Can you, is it, is it apples to apples to apply this here? Probably not. But at the same time, um, so is lightning work, and lightning work, okay, sorry, sidebar. And lightning, lightning is 10 times more common over land than over the ocean. And what a lot of algorithms do, because again, we all have to eat, is they just, they apply a scaling factor. But the storm doesn't know where it is. It doesn't know that it's over the ocean and now it's lightning is 10 times less likely. It only knows what's <laughs> physics, what physics are available to the cloud. Right? But sometimes that's too complex of parameterization. And again, we all have to eat. We need to make a map here. But so, you know, can we, you know, we don't want to just scale something to it. We don't have to have an Argentina scale factor. We want to actually drill down into like what thermodynamics are available to that cloud and why is it making hail differently. Okay, sorry, thank you. Thanks again.